Hey guys, today we are comparing the Sony ZV-E10 with the Sony A6400. Now, these cameras have a lot of similarities, from sensor size and resolution, all the way through to video frame rates and battery. And yet, like me and Zac Efron, despite the very obvious similarities, there are some key differences. For instance, I've never been in any movies about Ted Bundy, and as far as I know, he doesn't have a videography YouTube channel, so who is really winning? It's those kinds of important differences we will be exploring between the ZV-E10 and A6400, all without any high school musical numbers, guaranteed. So, just before we get started, let's hand over to Future Dave for an overview. Everything we are going to cover is listed with timestamps down in the description, plus you'll also find related videos and affiliate links if you'd like to support the channel. The settings used for both cameras are displayed on screen right now, but the short version is that our settings are deliberately identical, so any differences that you see are down to the cameras themselves. On that note, I've used the same Sony 16-50 f3.5-5.6 kit lens on both cameras unless otherwise stated. Review of that lens is coming in the future. And I'll be showing lots of side-by-side b-roll -side throughout, so you can see lots of examples of both cameras in identical conditions. You should also know I already did a deep dive comparison of the ZV-E10 and A6400 for low light performance in particular a couple of weeks ago. So we won't cover low light today. You can check out that video for all the deliciously dark details. And if you enjoyed today's video, then like, subscribe, let me know any questions or thoughts down in the comments, and let's begin by discussing core features. Both cameras have what appears to be identical sensors, APS-C size and 24.2 megapixels in resolution, which provides 4K video oversampled down from 6K. The video frame rate options are identical for both cameras and are shown on screen right now, topping out at 4K 30 and 120 frames slow motion in 1080p. While our focus on this channel is videography, it's worth noting that these two cameras have essentially identical photography features as well, including burst shooting up to 11 frames per second. Did you pick up on the vibe that these cameras have a lot in common? Well, the rest of our review is going to try and deep dive and focus on the areas where there are differences, but just before we get to that, let's clarify those other areas of commonality. For instance, slow motion options, which are the same on both cameras, but the ZV-E10 gets a handy shortcut button for S and Q, slow and quick mode, which makes it a little bit more accessible, which is nice. Both cameras have an image crop of around 1.15 times when shooting at 120 frames per second, compared to the uncropped 4K 24 frames per second read out, and since I'm already talking a bunch of crop, I'll point out that 4K 30 has a crop of around 1.23 times on both cameras as well, compared to that full readout at 4K 24. Nothing crazy, but do bear that in mind if you like to shoot at 4K 30. Now, bokeh and field of view are a direct result of the lenses that you choose to use with each camera, and both have access to an identical E-mount ecosystem, including native crop options, or as I like to call them, options and the ability to use full frame e-mount lenses in crop mode. So you can go from beautifully blurry bokeh in a wide shot with the Sigma 16mm f1.4, an even bigger bokeh bounty in mid shots from the Sigma 30mm f1.4, wide expansive views with the Samyang 12mm f2.0, or expansive zooms with the Sony 18-105 to as just a sample of the lens options. And with their identical sensor sizes, the same lens will give the same field of view and bokeh on either camera. So, like a corpse in the desert, this is a dead heat. But one thing that will change the performance we get from those mutually compatible lenses is our next topic. So, let's talk stabilization. And I already know this is going to be bad news for the A6400 because that camera has no built-in stabilization options, which means you are entirely limited to OSS or in-lens stabilization. And that is problematic for two reasons. Firstly, not every lens has OSS, so you're immediately limited to a subset of lens options if you want any stabilization without resorting to a gimbal. And secondly, the quality of OSS varies quite dramatically between different lenses. So something like the 16 to 50 kit lens we're using right now is decent for simple static movements like pans and tilts, but as soon as you try something more complex, like even a slow walk and vlog like this, you're going to end up with results that are more shaky and volatile than the average cryptocurrency market. Lenses like the 18-105 to f4 can give good stabilization results, but 
I really don't like being reliant on a limited selection of lenses that may not have the focal length or aperture that I want to shoot with. And how about the ZV-E10? Well, in-lens stabilization works exactly the same and has the same compatibility, but it's now called standard steady shot because we also get another type of steady shot. That is active steady shot, which is what you're seeing right now. This comes with a hefty price of a huge 43% crop into your image, but it will work with all unstabilized lenses and will give you consistently good results for simple handheld shots. Plus, in most situations, it's probably going to do better than in-lens stabilization for more complex movements like walking and vlogging. You can reduce the impact of that crop by using a wider lens like the Samyang 12mm f2, which I recently reviewed and which you are seeing right now. But there is another problem. I believe it was Beyonce who first said, I don't think you're ready for this jelly. And while no one has accused me of having a body which is too bootalicious, there's still a lot of visual wobble here because of the shared problem both cameras have with rolling shutter. And unfortunately, active steady shot doesn't do much at all to help with this. However, the ZV-E10 has an ace up its sleeve, something which means even holding this heavy rig at full arm's length, I can still be confident that the results are going to be smoother than Morgan Freeman covered in oil. And that is Catalyst Browse, where gyroscopic data recorded by the camera can be used in post-production to create really smooth, excellent stabilization results. There's more info on that in videos on Catalyst and the detailed ZV-E10 review, but the short version is that having Catalyst and Active Steady Shot means the ZV-E10 destroys the A6400 when it comes to stabilization. Just to finish and round off our stabilization discussion, I'm showing you side-by-side -side walking tests. First, with both cameras using in-lens stabilization, then switching to our extra option of active steady shot on the ZV-E10, where we get significantly steadier in exchange for that 43% crop. And finally, our other extra option on the ZV-E10 of catalyst stabilization, even better in exchange for an extra bit of post-production workflow. So the ZV-E10 winning strongly on stabilization doesn't really surprise me. But one thing that did surprise me was how it was priced. Right now, you can get it for £680, body only, or £770 if you include that 16-50 to kit lens. That compares to the A6400 priced at £949 or £999 respectively. So, body only, the A6400 is 40% more expensive, and with the kit lens, it's 30% more expensive. You could say the A6400 has been out much longer, so maybe you'll find a bargain second-hand, but looking at second-hand trade specialists, which provide some kind of warranty cover, at least in the UK, the ZV-E10 is often still cheaper. Okay, so design and build quality must be how that price difference is justified, right? Maybe not. The A6400 does feel a bit more solid, but that's largely due to a heftier weight and larger dimensions, both of which are listed on the screen right now. But Given how similar the performance is, I find it quite impressive that the ZV-E10 is noticeably lighter and more compact. Both cameras use the same NP-FW50 battery, another huge success in the Sony school of easily memorable and clearly relevant product names, although the 4K 24p video recording battery test showed mixed results. Over several tests, both cameras lasted in a range of around 85 to 100 minutes, with the A6400 and ZV-E10 both grabbing a couple of victories. Overall, there doesn't seem to be a substantial or consistent difference in battery performance, and both cameras will get you close to or over 90 minutes of 4K 24p shooting. Both also have flip screens, but the A6400 has one which flips up and over, meaning anything in the hot shoe will block the screen, unless you buy an accessory to relocate the hot shoe. That design is about as good as my idea for a hot sauce based hemorrhoid cream. By contrast, the ZV-E10 has a fully articulating flip out screen, which is better for high angles, portrait orientation shooting, and doesn't get in the way of anything. The A6400 does retain an electronic viewfinder though, while the ZV-E10 is solely reliant on its screen. This might be an important difference for some use cases, but personally, I don't really like using the EVF, so I don't really care. The screens on both cameras, when set to maximum brightness, cope pretty well with bright direct sunshine, although that is worth double checking if you live somewhere which is a lot sunnier and brighter than the UK. So, 
about 90% of the world, I think. Now, like a boat parking enthusiast, let's talk about ports. The ZV E10 wins comfortably in this category. Both cameras have audio input and micro HDMI output, but the ZV E10 also gets headphone output and has the superior USB C for charging and data rather than micro USB, which is what you'll get with the A6400. The A6400 does have a built in flash, unlike the ZV E10, but the only flash that I care about has a soundtrack by Queen. So this is another feature that is irrelevant for my use case, but it might not be for yours. Of more relevance to everyone, the A6400 also has a few more buttons available for customization and slightly nicer ergonomics too, but especially after considering the price difference, my winner here is the ZV E10. Now, yours could be different as some of these features and how important they are is a bit subjective, but our next category is more clear cut than a samurai circumcision seminar. So let's put aside painful sounding analogies and talk about autofocus. Both cameras have the same coverage in their autofocus systems. 425 phase and contrast detection points across 84% of the sensor, and both do a largely great job. I would trust either to give excellent performance in good light, but when things get trickier, the ZV E10 pulls into a significant lead. You can see a detailed comparison of the ZV E10 and A6400 in low light linked in the description, but the short version is that the ZV E10 autofocus works much better in low light, acquiring subjects and tracking them better in darker conditions and at lower ISOs. The ZV E10 also has the feature superiority here with eye tracking as well as face tracking in video, while the A6400 is limited to face tracking only. A sad fate when it's this face. Last but not least, the ZV E10 gets much more fine control over autofocus with seven levels of focus transition speed and five levels of tracking responsiveness, compared to just three and two respectively for the A6400. This is particularly helpful for controlling nice rack focus shots. Finer control allows for fuller flexibility as well as significant cinematic subtlety. So combined with having better features and superior low light performance, the win in autofocus goes to the ZV E10. But speaking of features beginning with A, how about audio? This is an audio test of the A6400, which you're hearing right now, compared to the ZV E10, which you're hearing now. Sony doesn't advertise any special features around the mic built into the A6400, whereas the ZV E10 has a mic which is one of its big selling points, a three capsule directional mic, which is supposed to be particularly good at isolating and enhancing the sound of voices. Plus, it comes with a handy little wind floof on top, which, as we've seen before, can be really effective in reducing wind noise. But what do you think? Which one is doing a better job? It's worth mentioning a few of the useful extra features that you get with the ZV E10. The first of which is product showcase mode. Now this is where you hold an object up to the camera and it will seamlessly switch from eye autofocus to focusing on the object that you're holding up, like so. Now you can get the same results on the A6400, but only if you completely cover your face. More gimmicky is the bokeh or background defocus button, which will focus or blur your background with a single button press. This is just a glorified aperture priority setting shortcut and is really not very useful once you know your settings a bit. The zoom rocker on the ZV E10 is pretty useful though. It works with power zoom lenses and clear image zoom for more convenient and smoother zoom results compared to handling the lens itself. Plus you get seven levels of fine control over zoom speed with the ZV E10 and much like with focus, more granular control gives more flexibility and cinematic shot design options. Nearly time to conclude, but first let's consider a quick comparison of color. And I can't really say there's much difference here. Throughout much of the video, I've been showing you both cameras side by side and at least when using my preferred picture profile of HLG mapped into standard dynamic range when I edit, the results from both cameras are very close. For my taste, both are pleasing when ungraded, and it's rare you'll see much difference in the same conditions with the same settings. However, when those rare differences do crop up, I would say the ZV E10 has marginally more realistic colors when compared to what I was seeing in reality. We also know from our low light comparison that the A6400 suffers more color 
color weirdness at high ISOs. So I'll give the ZV-E10 a very slight victory here, but both cameras can provide really nice results and leave plenty of room to grade. But who takes the overall victory? It's time for conclusions. By now, you know the core features of these two cameras are very similar and some of the core weaknesses like that rolling shutter as well. The A6400 may be the right choice if you need things like a built-in flash, an electronic viewfinder, plus you get slightly nicer ergonomics and a few more customizable buttons, but unless those things are really essential, for video users, I have to recommend the ZV-E10 as the better choice. It has better stabilization, both in terms of options and results, along with a number of really nice video-friendly extra features, from product showcase mode, more granular control over zoom and autofocus, as well as superior autofocus in low light especially, and I think these are significant advantages. Plus, the lighter and more compact form factor of the ZV-E10 isn't just convenient, but also helps with video shooting because it gives you more headroom on a gimbal setup. And all of this is before we even consider the fact that the ZV-E10 is priced much cheaper than the A6400. So the ZV-E10 takes the win for my use case and my overall recommendation for shooting video. But what about your use case and your thoughts? Let me know down in the comments. And since that brings us to the end of today's video, if you enjoyed it, then like, subscribe, check out the affiliate links in the description to support the channel. But most importantly, until next time, take it easy. Let's make a deal. I'll bring you food once I know it won't do you any harm. Sound fair? I'm going to take the fact that you're leaving and not killing me as a yes. Good. Hey, no grumbling. I assume your name is Terry. No grumbling, Terry.